Hello and welcome to this edition of Safety First. I'm your host, Frank Poulin. Today we're here at the Emergency Operations Center with Captain James Judkins, Emergency Management Coordinator, and we're going to talk about that season that everyone wishes would sometimes go away, and that is hurricane season. Captain, thanks for joining me. Uh, my pleasure. I, I look forward to this every year to, to get our message across to our citizens. Well, absolutely. It's an important message. Absolutely. Uh, because, you know, all, you know, every season is not uh, filled with numerous hurricanes. And mm -hmm. there are seasons we have that, that we don't have any, seasons we have a whole lot. But uh, the point we, we'll uh, try to get across as we work through today's program is it you know, just takes one. Absolutely. Now, now talk us through, I guess, the 2013 hurricane season. Was that a big one, would you classify it as, or...? moderate? Well, it kind of started out and it was predicted like it was going to be a really big season. Mm -hmm. okay, as, but as we got through the season, conditions in the Atlantic uh, changed. And there's about eight different uh, criteria that the, the weather experts uh, uh, look for. And we could spend a couple of three hours talking about <laughs> that, but, but we'll, we'll do an executive summary. Okay. Uh, of those eight uh, criteria, two uh, were uh, they, there were two actually that came into effect. And unfortunately, well, fortunately for us, yeah. those two criteria uh, made all the difference in the world uh, of decreasing the, the probability of hurricane formation in the Atlantic. And what were those two? Uh, sea surface temperature and, uh, and upper air shear. Okay, so, so it's when sea surface temperature rises? Right. It, it, hurricanes are basically uh, uh, heat feeders. In other okay. words, they feed off uh, the, the temperature. Uh, in the ocean, the warmer the sea surface temperature, the greater uh, the probability uh, of a, a developing storm has to strengthen. Okay. Uh, the the shear, uh, if, if you could uh, imagine a hurricane being like a chimney. Okay. Okay. It draws the heat up from the ocean, comes up through the, the storm itself, and then out over the top, and and it's just a continuous That's cycle. That's kind of. Okay. That shear is just like a pair of scissors across the top, and it knocks knocks that development off. So it's not. It, uh, it, it decreases the chance of it developing or developing as strong. Okay, and so, so basically it was a quiet season then? Yes, it was. We didn't, didn't have but two hurricanes, and the good, look, good thing about that, uh, they all uh, did not make land. Those two didn't make landfall in the United States. Now, are quiet seasons always a positive? Like if, if you just have a couple of named storms, is that a good thing, or can that turn into a bad thing? Well, uh, you, you can't... Uh, uh, set it up as, hey, if it's a quiet season, we don't have anything to worry about. Yeah. Because we look back to, to uh, 83, 1983 and, and 1992, uh, two very uh, uh, significant storms, the Alicia uh, in the Houston area and, uh, and Andrew uh, in the, uh, the Homestead, Florida area, okay. which is just south of Miami, devastating storm. So, and they were, they were a one of four and one of seven storms for that season. Oh, wow. Know? So, yes, yeah, so you can't rule a quiet oh, no. season now. No. 2014, that's kind of predicted to be a below average season? Yeah, a little, little below average season. Now. And, and we, we take a look at the, the various uh, uh, indicators that we get information from. Of course, the, the official indicator is uh, from the, the National Hurricane Season, mm -hmm. uh, National Hurricane Center. And then uh, Colorado State University, uh, the Klotzbach, uh, uh, a great team there. Uh, they've been doing it for a long time. They've got a lot of information. And then, of course, is our Weather Channel and Ac AccuWeather we, we're looking at there. But uh, as far as NOAA, uh, they're looking at about 8 to 13 storms. Oh, NOAA wow, okay. kind of spread, spread their uh, uh, predictions out. Three to six of those actually becoming hurricanes. And, uh, and from that, maybe one to four being uh, a, a, a major storm, which is a Cat 3 or above. Okay, so, so we're not out of the danger zone. Oh, no, no absolutely. And, and again, I want to drive home the importance. Uh, you know, it, it's not if and it's not when, and, and you should always uh, make sure that your, your personal or business hurricane plans are uh, up to date. Absolutely, because I, I know sometimes, you know, the, the people can get kind of into a frenzy when they hear about a hurricane. It's going to be a bad season. They start setting up. But if they say it's going to be a quiet season, they're like, okay, well, we can relax now. Yeah. And, and likewise, the longer period of time that uh, we go between having a hurricane, uh, the more relaxed we get. And uh, it's been that uh, situation or, or has been described as, as a form of, Maybe hurricane amnesia, okay. and not, not necessarily a good term, yeah. but, but the bottom line is the longer period of time that we get between an actual storm in, in, impacting Hampton Roads, northeastern North Carolina, city of Suffolk, mm -hmm. the more we let our guard down. It's just human nature. Yeah, absolutely. Now, are there any named storms yet, or do they have the names picked out? How do they work that? Well, uh, back in the early 50s, they actually started naming the storms. Before that, they just came up with... with, with 
uh, catchphrases, so to speak, the great New England hurricane, okay. you know, or, or, and, yeah. and the list just goes on and on. But in the actual 50s, the Hurricane uh, Center actually started naming storms. Okay. And, the, and the, they, the groups of names, there are four groups of names, and they actually take four-year cycles on that. Uh, and the, the storms that we have this uh, year will start at Arthur, Mm -hmm. and we'll wind down through Wilfrid. Okay. And of course, if we have a really, really, really active season like we had several years back, they'll start back uh, in, in a numerical order after okay. that. Okay, so they start circling yeah. the wagons yeah. and bring up another name. Yeah. And, and what is, I guess, for the viewers, the hurricane history in this region? Because I know it's, since we're on the, co the water, it is a very prevalent worry that we might have a hurricane. So just walk us through the history. Absolutely. When we look back through history, uh, First of all, before we get into history, back in the early days, there, there wasn't a, a National Weather Service or, or, or Weather Center. Uh, they actually started keeping the records somewhere around 1851. Oh, wow. Now, before then, there are numerous written records of hurricanes in, uh, uh, in coastal Virginia as well as all up and down the coast. Really? And those records came in, in the form of periodicals, newspapers, the magazines at the time, also ship's journals. That huh. uh, the, the ship's captain's journal. Well, if he was uh, if he was making his uh, way from point A to point B, he, he'd write the, write the daily conditions. Oh wow! And uh, that was a, a lot of the information. But uh, the the actual first recorded uh, uh, episode of a hurricane in Virginia was in uh, was in 1685. Uh, okay. In 16 and and. and Basically, it was just a, a brief description on uh, how high the water was, how many buildings were destroyed, and you see that okay. on, uh, right on through colonial history. And, and as as we moved up to, to, to uh, through the 18th and 19th century, and, and up into 20 history, you saw you saw it uh, move from uh, magazines and books right on up to uh, the print and broadcast media. Yeah, wow. So that's really an interesting story, the tale that certain different mediums can tell about the history of hurricanes in this region. Absolutely, uh, absolutely. Some of the, the, the more significant storms that, uh, that we normally hear about every, every year was the storm that, that formed Willoughby Spit, and the first one of that was in, eight, in 1749, and the oh, wow. second storm in, in, in 1806 has just piled up even more really? storm. And then we look at the storm that actually went down uh, uh, to the areas that we're all familiar with, Hatteras Inlet and <laughs> in, in, in Oregon in, spots. In Inlet. Yeah, that, that, that was formed by a storm uh, in 1846. Uh, with that being said, the storm buildeth and the storm can taketh away. Absolutely. Uh, uh, yeah. and, and when we look at the magnitude of that storm that, that, that formed Willoughby Spit, uh, what, kind, what kind of storm surge are we talking about? It's estimating, and again, they didn't have instruments back yeah. then. They're estimating that it was somewhere around a 15-foot storm surge. Whoa. Okay. And, and Storm surge, storm tides, two different, two different okay. terms. So Explain storm, to us what those are. Storm surge is, is that wall of water that precedes a hurricane. Okay. And that's affected by the basic size of the storm or how much real estate or water it encompasses. Kind of the winds churning up offshore. All right. The, the bigger the area, the, the bigger the, the area of wind circulation, as well as the, the, the depth of the ocean, the shallower the, the continental shelf, uh, the, the greater uh, okay. wave of water, a wall of water that you'll see. That's the reason you see such massive uh, uh, storm surges down in the Gulf. It's a little shallower than it is, okay. than it is off the Atlantic. Yeah. But uh, like, like when we look at Superstorm Sandy it, the, and the wall of water, that, that was a 10-foot wall of water. Because that was only a Cat 1, right? Uh, it, well, that was, you know, when it made landfall, yeah. it, it was just, it was extra tropical. Okay. But it had such a big footprint in the Atlantic, yeah. it, it was just like having a, this monstrous broom pushing up water. Wow. And, and that's the reason they got hit uh, on site. Now, on top of that storm surge is also the astronomical tides that we have. In other words, what the projected high tide is okay. for that day. So if we're in a, as the moon, as the, the moon affects the tides, as, mm -hmm. as you know, and, and the higher the tide is normally, you add that storm surge on top of it, so the, and that makes the, the total storm tide okay. on that. Got it. Wow. And, and, and now when you talk about, you know, creating these storm surges and tidal waves, uh, there are certain wind speeds that are with a hurricane. Can you kind of go over those wind speeds and what each means and how, I guess, nervous you should be yeah. with each one? Right. Uh, th there are five categories of storms. Uh, for Virginia, we, we use two, we use four, okay. because we've never had any history of anything getting beyond four. Actually, really? okay. if, we, if we look back at in our written history, mm -hmm. uh, in both official from the Weather Service and the, uh, the, the publications, 
uh, uh, about a, a low cat three is is what we've had here. Now, really? Oh wow! And, and what we're talking about uh, for for a cat one storm, uh, the wind speeds average between seventy four and up to uh, ninety five miles an hour. Wow! All right, uh, cat it's still two. Still fast. Oh yeah, it, it, it's it, it do a whole lot of damage, yeah. especially when you get those sustained winds. Uh, for three minute gust of, of, of that kind yeah, of Yeah, and now sustained wind is different than wind speed, correct? Well, it's sustained wind and wind gust. Okay. The, the, the gust is that certain bus, uh, gust of, of uh, wind speed at a certain level, and a sustain is just a a level, you know, a level. Say, uh, for something to be sustained, it's got to be a le got to make a three-minute run okay. uh, of the wind. Okay. So that uh, when we look at the, the Cat Two, that's 96 to 100, 110. Mm -hmm. Cat Three is uh, 111 uh, to 129, and uh, Cat Four is 130 uh, up to 158, and Cat and Five uh, it's 159 and above. Wow. Uh, fortunately. Uh, we haven't had any of those up here, and fortunately, there haven't been a whole lot of those across the country. But we have had some, and they've been very devastating, very devastating. Uh, Andrew, uh, the speed's okay. bumped up. Uh, yeah, and, and as you said, it just takes one it, it, it to does. make an absolutely it, devastating effect. It, it, it certainly so, does. So, so what should people be doing to prepare for the hurricane season? Okay. We stress every season the three basic things that individuals can do to, to make sure that uh, they are prepared. Uh, assemble their, their uh, family disaster supply kit, mm -hmm. get together and create your family uh, emergency plan, and the third and most important thing is staying informed both before the event mm -hmm. and, and through the event and, and after the event. Knowing what's going on. Exactly, and, and where can I go to get this and, and what services are available, that thing's all part of the, the, uh, the being informed piece. Okay, and then what goes into, I guess, the basic hurricane kit, and if you want to get a little more advanced, what would go into that? Okay. Uh, your, basic, your basic kit, uh, minimum, minimum criteria, a water supply uh, for three to five days, uh, non-perishable food items, uh, battery or crank powered radio, okay. flashlights, uh, any of your, your, your meds that you might have, prescription or non-prescription uh, meds. And as you start to build your kit out, the, the important papers that you have, your, mm -hmm. your, your wills, your deeds, uh, or, or in, in, in okay. important documents yeah. like insurance policy. Insurance policies are very important. Because uh, when you go to file the claim, it basically uh, the burden of proof is on, on the homeowner. Oh, so, okay. And it, it gives you the information what your coverage uh, what your coverage is, and uh, from that you know what to expect uh, when. Uh, so that's very you important start. information to know. Very important information uh, on that. Uh, if you have children, uh, you know the, the typical uh, infant supplies you need: diapers, foods. Uh, okay. Uh, if you have uh, individuals in your family with specific dietary needs, make mm -hmm. sure you, you, you have that provided. The medically fragile, uh, the, the equipment that they may need. Okay. Uh, uh, if they're on uh, some sort of durable uh, medical equipment that uh, maintain, that that's, needs electricity mm -hmm. to maintain it, what, what are you going to do uh, to to maintain that uninterrupted electrical supply yeah, for that device? And of course, uh, the answer to that question is, is of course, talk to your vendor. Okay. And if, <laughs> and if uh, uh, you, you don't get get good suggestions from from the vendor, you can always contact me in my office, and I okay. can give you some ideas. That's great. Uh, now, how many days should you prepare for, I guess, in an emergency kit? Well, when, when you look at a, at a storm as emergency manager, we recommend you have seven days. But, oh, wow. But, but various, uh, various other entities say a minimum of three days. So okay. we, for three to seven days, we prefer seven days. Because if you look back in things that happened in the city of Suffolk, uh, we can look at some ice storms mm -hmm. where we've been without electricity for 13 days in the really? various parts of our city. Oh, wow. And I know that, uh, you know, right before the storm, you know, you go to a grocery store and the shelves will be cleared out of non-perishable items and water. And so some people are, I guess, behind the ball kind of getting the stuff. How soon should you should prepare now, correct? Exactly. And for, for most of your supplies, and I'd say probably about 95% of the supplies, there are things that you could work into your diet day to day. Okay. You know, most people today... Uh, use bottled water. Mm -hmm. So having that three, uh, three to seven day supply of bottled water is just a matter of, of having an extra. extra case of two. Yeah, uh, got it. Likewise, uh, all of our pantries are, uh, either are or, sh or should be uh, have, have plenty of canned food. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously uh, frozen food is not a non-perishable food <laughs> yeah. item unless of course you've got whole house generator yeah. on, on that. So uh, the, the non-perishable food items are relatively easy. Things like that are easy to, to, to keep in your closet. The extra batteries, yeah. you know, that, uh, 
Uh, if, if you use a lot of battery devices in, in your home, radios uh, or flashlights, you probably got some in there. Okay. But, but that extra supply, again, again, uh, we don't expect everybody to run out to the store and buy all these things that uh, the, the third day before the storm comes yeah. in. Uh, if, if you assemble these things a little long, number one, you have them, yeah. and number two, it's not hard on, on, on the, the, the cash strap budgets. Absolutely. So get all this, uh, these items, stick it in a place in your home, and just make sure you know where it's there. So Absolutely. you can go to it when it's necessary. And, and that place, you know, you, you're obviously going to have a, a shelf or a closet for them, but a container, a, 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 right, a like rubber made container, a rubber made container, backpacks. Uh, backpacks is especially good if, if you're in an area where you have to evacuate. Okay. The, the rolling uh, 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 rubber made Carts containers, or whatever, yeah, yeah. They, they're good. That way you get everybody, uh, everybody in your house, hey, okay, we got to evacuate. You grab, grab all the things, you load them in the car, and then you, you go to where your, your predestined, uh, predestined place is. Now, uh, you mentioned kind of the family plan. Now, 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 what does that entail? Is that, you know, phone numbers for making sure you know who to get in contact with or, you know, emergency numbers? What, what kind of plan would that be? Actually, it's all of the above, okay. uh, Frank. When, when, you assemble, when you create your plan, the first thing you need to do is, of course, get everybody together. Mm -hmm. And obviously, that's a chore in this, in this <laughs> yeah. electronic age. Yeah, try to have a family it. meeting. Yeah, but you want to get everybody together and, and start a conversation mm -hmm. as to what are the uh, the priorities or what are the biggest dangers where we live mm -hmm. uh, is it flooding <laughs> is trees falling on the house is uh, the loss of electricity uh, is uh, is is there some danger of, of hazardous material incidents happening near our home okay uh, you know these are all things to take into consideration mm -hmm. uh, so w once you develop your your risk uh, your risk list then you can start making your plans from uh, okay uh, and, and the plans uh, consists of uh, some out-of-town contacts mm -hmm. because uh, as, as great as electronics are these days, <laughs> many times you can't call across town yeah. to check in. Uh, that, that cell towers are down. Yeah, order. cell towers are down, that, that, that sort of thing. So out-of-town contacts. Uh, uh, there are actually many services now that are set up on the web where you can can, can text in and, and put that location. Okay. On. And, and that's, that, that's something that individuals can investigate yeah. for that. Uh, and a, a place of assembly, uh, when you create your fire plan for your house, your fire evacuation plan, we always teach uh, the, the little ones in, in school, have a place where everybody can meet outside. Same thing okay. with, with a hurricane. Have a place that you can meet. If it's, if it's not on your property, maybe somewhere else in town or somewhere out of town okay, yeah. where the individuals can meet. Just so everyone knows where to go in the event of an actual emergency. Exactly. So, there, there, there are many times you, you can't get back home. The roads are blocked, mm -hmm. uh, trees down, flooding, that sort of thing. Perfect example, when we had the tornado uh, come through the area in 2008, yeah. the, the, those uh, subdivisions were completely shut off. Mm -hmm. So families, in, in that case, needed a place where they can go okay. uh, because they couldn't get home and assemble and, and then set their plans on what they can do from that point. Since they knew about it, they could go there Absolutely. and this way you're getting Pretty contact with people after that. So the biggest... I guess the biggest takeaway would be make sure you get your plan started now. And, and, and what would be the high points, I guess, of this? So it would be, you know, the emergency kit, the family plan, and then you mentioned staying informed. Yeah, staying informed. And, and back again to the plan, uh, yeah. those, those numbers, those, okay. those emergency contact yes. numbers, the, the utility numbers, uh, the medical numbers, uh, that, that sort of thing like that. All right, the staying informed piece. Uh, that can cover a, a lot of area because there are a lot of methods that we can, can stay informed. I, I was going to say, because we just mentioned if cell towers go down, so yeah. what if cable goes out and you have no reception? How, how, yeah. What are some other methods that we don't think about today? Well, here's a, with that, what you just mean, that this is another item you could put in your kit, uh, a digital antenna. Okay. Just plug in your TV and reprogram it to antenna TV. Really? And uh, if you've got electricity, okay. you, huh. you, it'll work. Uh, so, so, so that's an option there. Telephones. Uh, if a wireless phone mm -hmm. is the only phone you have in your house, then you need to run out to the, uh, the local store and get you one to just plug in and dial. Okay. Yeah, a hardwired yeah. phone. Uh, because no electricity, no way to charge your battery on the wireless phone, uh, you know, it, 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 no way to operate the system. Absolutely. So make sure you have at least one hardwired phone mm -hmm. in, in, in your home. Uh, is radios? If radios. You... Uh, and we, we talked earlier about the, the crank radios. Yeah. Uh, uh, they're, they're pretty neat. Uh, okay. Some of the models that they have now actually have a port in them where you can crank and charge your cell phone. Really? So th that gives you another option. And a lot of them are affordable, too. I know uh, it's a, a lot of these you know, gifts you get at kind of Christmas or whatever. 
Yeah, the, the crank phone starts at you know, somewhere around 50 bucks. Okay, then, yeah. Then, then, then go up from there. But uh, they're really... Uh, they're but they'd really be invaluable in the event of a storm. Absolutely. There, there are even flashlights that you can... Uh, that are the same way that you shake them for so many minutes and you, you, you got a beam. Okay. Uh, so, so there's some really creative stuff out there that you can put <laughs> in, your, in your kit like that. Uh, social media. Uh, that is becoming probably one of the most uh, important uh, ways for folks to communicate and find out what's going in our locality. Yeah. And, and back uh, in 2011, when we activated the Emergency Operations Center here for Irene, okay. we found out the value of social media. Because really? Because people out of town were after the event were telling us, this is the way we found out what was going on with our family back in Suffolk. So well, that's really... A, that's a, amazing. A, a, yeah. it's, it's really... It has more power than, than the average person uh, uh, could believe. So with the information that we were posting uh, on the social media, uh, that is really a, a great tool. Uh, and, and, and I guess how did, because if a big storm is activated here in Suffolk, then the, this room, the Emergency Operations Center, comes into play, correct? Absolutely. This is where the city is. This is where the city will be run. All all the part, department heads of the, of the critical city departments, the city manager, uh, will, will be here. And this is where the decisions will be made, and the city will be operated until we uh, we we uh, migrate out of the recovery. And in this building will almost always have power, correct? This right. Room? We've got uh, we've got uh, our backup generator here, mm -hmm. and we've got a port where we can uh, have a a backup to the backup. Okay. And the, probably one of the, the neatest features we have, we're just down the road from the power station. So oh, wow. there, there's not as many chances <laughs> yeah. for the power to go off. I'm not telling you it won't go yeah. off, but there's not as many chances for At it to go At least hopefully off. repair will be a lot faster, <laughs> right? <laughs> right. But uh, we, we, do, we do have those redundant uh, uh, systems in place as well as for telephones. Mm -hmm. And, and the screens behind us too as well. I mean, you guys are tracking storms and their, their frequency or their wind yeah. speeds constantly, correct? Ab absolutely. And, and uh, we've got screens all around the room, and this is this is what uh, we call situational awareness. Uh, okay. And with this information is how we base our our decisions. We've even got models we can run as far as uh, when will the onset of tropical force winds uh, uh, come to our city. So we, uh, there's a lot of tools oh, wow. that we have. So you can here. kind of uh, do models, I guess, and forecast as, when we really need to get in gear, so to speak. Would yeah, that be appropriate? yeah, and, and based on that, and also we've got models to uh, project uh, the storm surge and, and uh, the, the tides and areas that are affected, and we can even tell you how many homes oh, wow. uh, that, that, that can be affected. And we, and we, do, we can run this model before time, and, this, and the city can actually craft this message going out saying these are the areas that are going to be affected and you, you should take action now. Okay, and, and I know Suffolk is obviously a growing city, and a lot of people are moving in and moving by the water because, you know, it's such a nice area. But uh, some of them might be in low-lying floodplains, correct? A absolutely, yeah. and, and I get calls from people uh, that are looking to, to buy homes here mm -hmm. on a regular basis, okay. and they say, hey, is this, this property in a flood zone? And, mm -hmm. and then I can consult my uh, the maps and and uh, my models and tell them, hey, you're not in a flood zone, but hey, that, you're not out of the woods because you're in the area subject to hurricane surge. Yeah. So uh, uh, there's been a lot of talk about the, the flood maps recently because FEMA has actually updated uh, the, oh, did the, flood, okay. uh, the recent updates. So this, people are aware, particularly if they're in an area uh, subject to flooding, because if they're buying a home, mm -hmm. then their mortgager makes them have flood insurance. And so, that's kind of the third part of the plan as well, make sure you know information. A a absolutely. And absolutely. so this way here, that would inform your plan, I imagine. Mm -hmm. And you kind of, you kind of mentioned um, e evacuation. Now, evacuation is kind of a last resort, correct? Absolutely. Just like uh, evacuation as well as going to uh, a public shelter is, is something we like to say is a last resort. Okay. Uh, and, and, shelter, and when is that decision kind of made? Sorry, I didn't mean to cut I, you off. When, when we, we start having these major uh, storms coming in, uh, the decision-making process starts uh, about 96 hours out. Okay. So we're actually looking, uh, when the decision-making process is beginning, we're looking at a day like we have outside today. Uh, beautiful day. Beautiful yeah. day. And, you know, when you start talking about evacuation in days like that, you know, it's, it's hard to get somebody uh, to, to move. Yeah, uh, absolutely, to take it seriously. Absolutely. But kind first, of the hurricane yeah, amnesia you yeah, mentioned earlier. Exactly. And, and when you start getting down to about the 39, 36 hour period, that's when the decision to go to no go okay. has, has got to be made. Now, for the city of Suffolk, we are very fortunate because we've got a lot of area that's high and dry. Okay. So, whereas our neighbors in Chesapeake, Norfolk, Portland, Virginia Beach may have to leave the area, mm -hmm. uh, 
residents of the city of Suffolk just may need to relocate within our city. Oh, really? That's this interesting. This becomes the importance of pre-planning, mm -hmm. knowing uh, knowing friends, family, or even uh, some of our, our our hotels in the city where you can relocate. Yeah. Because you know, you know, going to Richmond, you know, that's where everybody from Norfolk and Portsmouth is heading up to the Richmond area and and, and up west. 64, and that yeah. gets clogged. And, and, exactly, and we know what traffic is day to day. Yeah. So if, imagine with a hurricane. Yeah. I exactly. And how we see it on holiday weekends, yeah. especially. So this is where the planning piece that we have becomes more and more important. Yeah. Do I really need to evacuate, or do I just need to hunker down and stay where I am? Yeah, because it was kind of earlier we were talking, and it seemed like the emergency kit was most important. But now it seems like the planning might be the most important yeah. part of this. It's kind of like dominoes. They yeah. all kind of, when, when one fall, they one falls into place, they all come together. And uh, the planning piece, the kit piece, and, and the staying informed piece uh, all, all come together. And, and staying in, informed, and you know, we talked about social mm -hmm. media earlier, let's not forget uh, some of the subscription service, specifically our Suffolk on the Alert. Okay. Uh, and, and that's something you, you sign up to. Obviously, uh, the, the downside of that is for somebody uh, to, to sign up. It's not an automatic thing. Yeah, you've got to opt in. But that's part of your planning process. Mm -hmm. Where can I get information? And we don't want anybody to forget that piece about Suffolk on the Alert. Absolutely. Now, if they want more information or to learn about the flood maps, for example, who, who do they contact? What number do they call? Is there a website? Oh, well, uh, all of the above. There. Okay. <laughs> all right. On the City of Suffolk's emergency management website, mm -hmm. we actually have an interactive flood map that, that, that you can consume to your address and see whether or not you're in that, that firm or, or the 100-year floodplain that your flood insurance is on. Okay. Now, if you're interested in hurricane sur surge, you just give me a call at the office, and I'll create a map uh, based on your address okay. and, and email it back to you. You can come by here, and, uh, and I'll print it off and, and give it to you. Uh, like that. But I have an awful lot of citizens that, that we exchange this information through email and it works good for them, works okay. good for yeah, me. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and I did one just last week and you know, people were most surprised with the information that they had because all they thought they had to worry about was the, was the, uh, the, the, the areas designated to flood in, in the FEMA flood okay, map. Yeah. But when I showed them the, the possibilities for hurricane surge, it opened up whole new av avenues of, uh, of planning for them. Okay, well, great. Well, thank you so much for enlightening us on the dangers of a hurricane. And, folks, you heard it here first that the most important piece is making sure that you're getting that emergency kit, your family plan, and then, of course, the last piece. Staying informed. Staying informed. Thanks for joining us for this edition of Safety First.